Hi everybody, this is chapter three in the landmark um, history of the American people. And as I'm reading today, um, I'm starting on page, um, uh, it, it doesn't ever put the page numbers on those, but it's pages 14 and 15. So it looks something like this for you guys. There's a timeline on the bottom, which I think is super helpful. And as I'm reading today, I want you to be listening to, um, it says Southerners were concerned about new states being added as slave free, which would eventually outnumber slave states. What did Southern politicians propose as a solution to this matter? So be listening for that. Be listening for the words Missouri Compromise. Be listening for Stephen Austin. Um, be listening for Dark Horse. Be listening for the name Polk, P-O-L-K. And um, be listening for Annexation of Texas. And I'm gonna have all these things listed in the reading for you. But be listening for those, okay? Because when we do, we're going to discuss them. So we are on page 15. The powers of the national government were increasing, and the slave states feared that the government might use these powers to destroy slavery. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 had set up the Add a State Plan. It also prohibited slavery in all new states that would be carved from the territory northwest of the Ohio River. And if you remember, I showed you a map last time where the Ohio River was, right? I'm going to show you again. Okay, take a look right here is the Hawaii, Ohio River. So take a look at that. You guys have that in chapter one if you need to see it again. But um, any new states above the Ohio River could not have slavery. In 1803, the Louisiana Purchase added lands as large as the whole area of the original 13 states. And nervous slave, Southern slave owners had more reason than ever to be fearful. What would happen when those lands were sliced up into new states? Would those states also be set up under a law that forbade slavery? If that should happen, then the slave states, the very states that had once dominated the Union, would become only a small minority. And then the national government in Washington would no longer understand the South and its problems. It might even launch a crusade against slavery and destroy the peculiar institution. And if you remember, we talked about peculiar institution last chapter. That was another way word for slavery that the slave that the southern states were using. Southern politicians decided there was only one way to avoid this danger. They had to ensure that whenever the federal government carved one new state out of the West, it always paired that state with another. One of the new states would be slave and the other would be free. One would permit slaves and the other would not. If the national government could follow this policy, then it would not matter how uneven unevenly the population grew. So, um, and that's the first question that I have on there for you. Take a look at that. Southerners were concerned about new states being added as slave free, which would eventually outnumber slave states. What did Southern politicians propose as a solution to this matter? What did they propose? New states would come in pairs, one a slave state and one a free state in order to maintain a balance. Um, nor would it matter how many more congressmen the North might have in the House. In the Senate, where each state had two votes, no more and no less, slave states would be able to block any threatening laws. In this way, the South could actually use the add a state plan to preserve slavery. The story of how new states were added in the early 1800s reads like a tug of war. Each side added one whenever the opposite side added one. By the end of 1819, Okay, and on our calendar, on our calendar, on our timeline there on the bottom, right, where it starts at about 1820 on this page. Um, by the end of 1819, there were 22 states in the Union, and the sides were precisely even. 11 slave states, 11 free states. The population of the whole country had grown to nearly 10 million people. Since the North was growing faster than the South, there were about half a million more people in the North. That meant that in the House of Representatives, the North had 105 members against only 81 for the South. But in the Senate, of course, the two sides were still even. When the territory of Missouri applied to Congress for statehood in 1819, the South held its breath and prepared for its first great struggle to defend slavery. Louisiana, admitted as a state in 1812, had been the first one carved out of the Louisiana Purchase. But Louisiana, where slavery had long existed, was plainly Southern. There was no question about it being a slave state. Missouri, however, was quite another matter, for Missouri was located squarely in the middle, halfway between the northern and the southern boundaries of the newly purchased west. Was Missouri to be slave or free? 
In Congress then, the battle lines were drawn. Some Southerners already believed they were in a life and death struggle. If they let Missouri go free, the Union would surely be flooded by still more and more free states. Then it was only a question of time until the national government would abolish it everywhere. Okay, so take a look at the little map I have on page 16 here. See this little map right here? Take a look at that in your book. Congress drew a line through the Louisiana Purchase at 36 degrees and 30 degrees north latitude. That's lines of latitude and longitude, which if you haven't learned about in school, you will. It extended the southern boundary of Missouri and declared that no one could own slaves north of that line. So the question was, what is the Missouri comp Compromise? Missouri became a slave state, while Maine became a free state. A line through the Louisiana Purchase was drawn, and it was declared that no one could own slaves north of the line. No, it wasn't really a true compromise. So the Missouri Compromise admitted Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state. Congress then drew a line through the Louisiana Purchase at 3630. It extended the southern boundary of Missouri and declared that, except in Missouri, no one could own slaves north of that line in Louisiana Purchase territory. A new bitterness entered the halls of Congress. Northern congressmen argued that to allow slavery into the West would be a national disgrace. As the debate went on, it simply confirmed the fears of Southerners that the free states were out to destroy slavery, and with it, the South. Congress passed the Missouri Compromise in 1820 after a whole year of debate. And that is on your timeline there. Missouri Compromise establishes um, right there um, in that. And we're gonna, I'm gonna have a little video attached so you can understand a little bit more about the Missouri Compromise, okay? But it was not so much a compromise as a stalemate. The compromise followed the rules of the North-South tug of war that had been going on for at least 20 years. Each side added one, one state to its team. Congress admitted Missouri as a slave state, while to balance it, they admitted Maine as a free state. At the same time, they drew a line through the rest of the Louisiana Purchase at 3630 latitude. It extended the southern boundary of Missouri and declared that no one would be permitted to own slaves north of that line. And this is a little confusing, so I'm gonna have a video attached, like I said, that will explain a little bit more about the Missouri Compromise for you. So at the time, people called it a compromise. The framers of the Constitution, um, although people at the time called it a compromise, it was not really like the compromises the framers of the Constitution made in 1787. For example, think of the compromises between the large and small state that created the House of Representatives with its proportional representation and the Senate with its equal representation. Those earlier compromises gave each side part of what it wanted, but slavery was a different kind of question. When it came to slavery, both sides felt it was all or nothing, and both sides were simply biding their time. Far-sighted men saw that the Missouri Compromise was nothing more than a truce. It kept the sides from going to war, but it also announced an upcoming fight to the finished. Aged Thomas Jefferson was sad. The compromise, he said, was a fire bell in the night, the death knell of the Union. John Quincy Adams saw it as a title page to a great tragic volume. If the nation had been growing and moving west a bit slower, the truce between north and south might have lasted longer, but it was growing quickly and it was moving west very rapidly. The next crisis came over Texas. Stephen Austin started an American settlement in Tejas, number, in Tejos, sorry, Tejos, Mexico, the year after the Missouri Compromise. He was so successful that he soon attracted thousands of immigrants from the United States to settle in the Mexican territory. Austin was born in Virginia. He attended college in Kentucky and had lived in Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana. He had run a store, directed a bank, edited a newspaper, and served as an officer in the militia. He was a good-natured dictator, and he was a pro-slavery man. He owned slaves. He brought slaves into Tejas, what the American settlers were now calling Texas, and he was determined to protect slavery in this new settlement. So when the Mexican authorities, are you good? You good? Okay, that's my friend Tristan. She just walked in. So she's gonna eat her snack while I'm finishing my video. So when the Mexican authorities said that the slavery was to be um, abolished in Mexico, and when it became clear that they intended to enforce their law, Austin led a revolt. In 1836, the American settlers in Texas declared their independence from Mexico and they claimed control of the portions of the Mexican states 
of Nuevo Mexico, and I'm not gonna pronounce these very well, Chihuahua, Covahua, and Tamaulipas that had never been part of Texas. The Mexican government lacked the power to stop these Texans from leaving Mexico or from claiming to own the additional territory they claimed. So Texas became an independent country settled and run by the people from the United States. And it seemed obvious to most Americans that it was only a matter of time before the Texans would ask to join the union. Okay, so this says, what did Stephen Austin do in response to Mexico abol abolishing slavery in Texas? Okay, so listen up to what he did about that. The new Republic of Texas was so big, there was no telling how many new states someone might carve from her territory, but there was no question that Texas was slave country. It is not surprising then that when the people of Texas asked to become part of the United States, Northern congressmen voted it down. Texas, they said, was nothing but a slave, slave owner's clever plot to smuggle a lot of new slaves into the Union. For years, the Northern states managed to keep Texas out of the Union. But Texas drew the country's energy away from all other questions. At the time of the presidential election of 1844, the Texan, Texas question was more alive than ever. The popular desire for compromise was so great that the Democratic Party actually refused to nominate their best known leader, Martin Van Buren. Van Buren had already been president once, but he had said he was against annexing Texas. Instead of Van Buren then, for the first time in American history, a party nominated a dark horse. Okay, so I'm gonna go back a little bit to this map. Everybody take a look at that map right there. We're gonna talk about that for a second on page 17. In 1836, the American settlers in Texas declared their independence from Mexico and they claimed control of portions of the Mexican states. And those were, and I just had pronounced them all right, Alta California, Nuevo Mexico, Mexico Chihuahua, Cohuilla, Nueve Leon, and Tam Tamalupis. I wish I could speak Spanish better. That had never been part of Texas. They claimed control of those portions of these states that were east and north of the Rio Grande River. Okay, so take a look at all the portions that they claimed for Texas. As you can see, that's way more than Texas has now, right? It's all that in California too. The Mexican government lacked the power to stop the Texans from leaving Mexico or from claiming to own the additional territory they claimed. So Texas became an independent country settled and run by people from the United States. So question three on there, what did Stephen Austin do in response to Mexico abolishing slavery in Texas? He led a revolt, revolt, declared independence from Mexico, and Texas became an independent country. And now we're going to talk about dark horses, which is question number four there. What's a dark horse? And that's an unknown candidate who few think will be a good candidate. It would be like all of a sudden we are like, oh, Joe down the street here is going to run for president. That would be a dark horse. Instead of Van Buren, and I'm on page 18 now, a party nominated a dark horse, a man not known in the nation as a whole and someone whom few had imagined would make a good candidate. There's a garbage can under the counter over there. The man's name was James Polk, James K. Polk. He had once served as a governor of Tennessee and he was a loyal Democrat. The Whigs, W-H-I-G-S, ran Henry Clay as their candidate. Clay was famous and the Whigs ridiculed the Democrats for choosing a man who was unknown. It happened that earlier that year, the polka had become the most popular dance in Washington. The polka dance will now be the order of the day, said the Whigs. It means two steps backward for one in advance. But the Whigs were wrong and Polk carried the day. Polk had a formula for compromise, his word, expansion. To annex Texas all by itself seemed a menace, at least to the north, but the Oregon Territory stretched far up into the northwest. The United States had been sharing the Oregon Territory with Great Britain. If at the same time you annex Texas, you also annex the Oregon Territory, you would then have something to give the north in return. So take a look at the, on the two maps I have there on page 18. U.S. President Polk had a formula for compromise, expansion. To annex Texas all by itself seemed, seemed a menace, okay? So the United States have been sharing the Oregon Territory. You guys see where the Oregon Territory is on the map? So in 1845, the U.S. Congress admitted Texas as a state of the Union, a gift to pro-slavery Southerners. Shortly afterwards, it claimed the Oregon Territory from Britain, a gift to the anti-slavery Northerners. U.S. President Polk at first demanded from Britain a stretch of land that the United States and Britain had shared since 1818. 
It reached all the way to the borders of Alaska, which was then owned by Russia. Eventually, however, Polk settled on the 49th parallel, the northern boundary of the United States territories, immediately to the east of the Oregon Territory. And we'll have a video that will help you a little bit more with that. That was Pope's platform. That's the thing he was going to run on. Expand everywhere at once. Then there would be something for everybody. Besides, the very thought of stretching the nation all the way to the Pacific was exhilarating. Pacific Ocean. Perhaps the nation could be united simply by marching westward together. In a divided nation, growth could be a kind of compromise. And so it happened. So what was Pope's formula for compromise? Territorial expansion. That's the answer. Expand. In 1845, the United States finally admitted Texas as a state of the Union. The agreement by which Texas joined the Union provided that no more than four additional states would ever be carved from her territory. Moreover, the Missouri Compromise line would extend over Texas. That gave something to the South. It ensured that the South would have more territory they could potentially turn into slave states. Later that year, living up to his campaign promise, Polk claimed for the United States the Oregon Territory. That was something for the North. But many people wanted to, be, to quiet the conflict between North and South. For them, Polk's program created problems. Even though Mexico had not been able to defeat the Texas rebels when they declared their independence, Mexico still viewed the Texas territory as part of its own. And so it viewed the United States annexation of Texas to be an act of war. Meanwhile, a new trouble spot had developed in California. California at the time was part of Mexico. But settlers from the United States were beginning to move into California. And the Mexican government wanted to keep all Americans out of California. They were afraid California would go the way of Texas. So Mexico threatened war. Northerners, however, feared that the United States would defeat Mexico and the victory would give more territory to Southern slaveholders. Then the United States would have even more slave states. It was only over Northern opposition then that Polk led the United States into war against Mexico. And in 1848, United States forces captured Mexico City. The helpless Mexican government then gave up all claims to Texas. It agreed that Texas belonged to the United States. But that was only the start. There's San Francisco in 1847 before the California gold rush there on the bottom of page 19. Okay. Before the war, Mexico had owned all the land in the far west that reached up to Oregon from the Mexican border of today. Mexico also owned all of the lands between the Pacific Ocean and Texas. Mexico now handed all that territory over to the victorious United States. In other words, they handed over the territory of the present states of California, Nevada, Utah, most of Arizona, and large portions of New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. These lands, including Texas, were larger than the whole Louisiana Purchase, or all of the original United States. When the Constitution was adopted, this should have satisfied any American's yen for expansion. Yet when President Polk asked the Senate to approve the Mexican treaty that gave the United States all the territory, this territory, a dozen senators voted against it. Why? Because they wanted to annex all of Mexico and still the treaty passed. So why did the annexation of Texas to the United States bother Mexico? They considered Texas to be a Mexican territory and they considered the U.S. annexing it as an act of war. So that's why that happened. But it took no profit to predict that more Western land spelled more trouble. Every new acre was a new subject for debate, or rather for a quarrel. Southerners did not bother to study whether these new lands were really places where slavery and the plantation system would flourish. They were thinking only about spreading slave power. In the bitterly divided nation, every stroke of national good luck became a new cause of discontent. Each section was afraid the other would somehow gain war. Okay, so if you look at that map there, that helps you out here. So we've got the territory, the pink is the territory, and I'm right here, okay, on page 20. The pink is the territory of the original 13 colonies, and then the orange was Louisiana Purchase, and then the pur purple was Texas, that was acquired by the U.S. in 1845, and then there's all the land, the dark purple, that was acquired by the U.S. in 1848, and then we had the Gadsden Purchase, which was acquired in 1854. And then we've got that, that cross pattern with sort of an overlapping claimed territory. Um, so following the United States victory in the Mexican-American War in 1848, which we don't talk about very often, Mexico relinquished its rights to all of these territories and handed them to the United States. 
Um, so these former Mexican lands were larger than the original 13 states. This is shown in the picture. Um, the southwest corner of Louisiana, which is shown in light green there, you can kind of see it. It's this tiny little green spot that's in between the orange and the purple. Um, is often identified as part of Louisiana Purchase, but the United States acquired it not by purchase, since it was outside the Mississippi River watershed. Rather, Americans were able to create settlements there without opposition, and so it became a part of the United States. Okay, so that is part one of chapter three, and I'm gonna have some other videos and some other stuff for you to watch, so um, I'll have some more instructions for you on um, our, th our uh, Google Classroom. And then I will be posting chapter three, part two next.